Hello and welcome, Christian filmmakers. I am Ipwishin, also known as Ippolit. Today I am going to make a strange comparison. How the art of filmmaking is like the art of cooking, serving and eating food. In our episode on the academic approach to semiotics, we have debunked French philosopher Roland Barthes' assertion that the order of dishes during a luncheon has the properties of a language. Yet there is another way of making sense by comparing food with film, when we look at aggregate states. When you arrange for a, say, six-course meal for your guests, you will consider the order of the dishes from their point of view as some sort of storytelling experience. You will undoubtedly avoid serving only food of gruel-like consistency. You will look for a great variety of flavors and aggregate states. There will be soup, crispy stuff, juicy food, things sour, hot or on the sweet side, fresh, raw, stuff like salad, also beverages and so on. Let's use the order of a set meal as a metaphor for movie plots. In this metaphor, we compare the flavor of a dish to the emotional content of a scene and the aggregate state to the genre or subgenre. In our lessons about semiotics, we introduced the three primary semiotic effects. Generic, dealing with the minimum of visual features required to make a thing recognizable. How do we recognize a shark as a shark? Then there's the individualization effect, adding detail and striving for more naturalism and authenticity. Finally, we have the foil effect, which is all about putting your object in context. This effect creates the meaning of what you want to show by the use of contrast. Speaking of sharks, let's once again take a look at the first big summer blockbuster movie, Jaws. In terms of genre, the defining thing is are the teeth that gave the movie its title. It clearly indicates horror. Yet in order for the horror to work best, we need some relief now and then provided by moments that make us laugh. So there's some comedy amidst all the terror. But there is also, of course, dialogue involved. This is where the psychological drama evolves when characters negotiate through their paths of obstacles. Then there is the call to action when the beast strikes again. These genres within genres I refer to as aggregate states, like in our comparison to a set meal. Therefore, we can identify four reference points that enable us to form some sort of a matrix. We have an x-axis and a y-axis. On top, we put the designator for the genre the film signals for promotion. In the case of Jaws, as we said, this would be horror. At the bottom, we place the indicator for the genre that will continuously create sharp contrasts. In our case, that's comedy. Every scene plays out within this range. Now, let's add an indicator for whether a scene is more on the dialogish side or more action-prone, and we can pinpoint every scene on that chart where it belongs. Moreover, we can watch scenes jumping up and down, left and right, as the plot progresses. At the very beginning, the movie creates an eerie atmosphere with the help of John Williams' famous signature theme, and an uncanny point of view of the predator. Let's place that scene somewhere up the horror axis, not too high, but maybe halfway between neutral and absolutely terrifying. Cut to the happy drunken kids at the beach. Watching them flirt and stumble is not entirely without humor. Therefore, let's place this interlude on the funnier side, with more dialogue, hardly any action. And that's when terror strikes, setting up the premise of this movie. 
so we have to jump over the axis to the opposite side. Action combined with terror. Cut to the hero of this movie. By the way, be sure to check out my video on the properties of a movie hero, episode 7. Now, in the beginning of this movie, he's portrayed as a bit of a klutz. Here he confuses the receivers of his phones. Yes, this movie plays at a time when phones still had receivers. That's not hilariously funny, but certainly on the more dialogish side. So we have to jump all the way back to almost where we started a moment ago. Next stop, we find the remains of the shark's victim. What we see, though, is what in lesson number two we called an Alcatraz chick. The gory visceral details are avoided and rather circumscribed by the depiction of a plethora of crabs around what looks like hair, weed and a hand sticking out. Therefore, we stay on the non-action side but jump from funny to uncanny. By now we can already see the overall pattern. We jump over the lines for the scenes to become effective and gradually we strive to fill the empty spaces in that chart. So by the end, when the movie has turned into a full-fledged action movie, we have had a rich menu indeed. The whole dramatic space is filled up by now, thus having given us a nutritious course of events. This approach provides a way to structure a movie without resorting to the often overused three acts paradigm academic film professors teach. Moreover, you can altogether eschew any formulaic approach to the structure of a movie by thinking in terms of aggregate states. All you have to do is to figure out between what opposite states of genre your movie oscillates. With most commercially successful movies, it is easy to determine in between which genres they operate. Some move from horror to science fiction and back, some from science fiction to fantasy, some from comedy to horror, or let's say funny horror in that case. For instance, in Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds, we gradually but consistently shift from screwball comedy to that. Now, what about movies with religious motives? Let's consider the monumental epic Ben-Hur. You find all sorts of aggregate states in such a movie. Obviously, its signal genre is period drama, with lots of gruesome moments, battle scenes, love interest and more in the mix. Arthouse movies have a more subtle way of moving between genres. Ingmar Bergman's famous The Seventh Seal is a period drama about the Middle Ages on the outside. Yet there are many nuances. It's a psychological drama as well as a philosophical one. I think that movies like this shift between a genre movie and a poetic movie with lots of literary references. Maybe the greatest Christian movie, I dare say the greatest movie of all time, is Carl Theodor Dreyer's Ordet. Here the religious drama turns into a highly emotional melodrama without ever going over the top. Many poetic moments can be found, excellent character studies and profound dialogue. For Christian filmmakers, this is the movie to look for. And that's it for this week. What are your thoughts on aggregate states in movies? Do you think you could make use of that? Let me know in the comment section. See you next week and God bless.